And welcome <laughs> to the Downer Front Podcast, the official podcast of DownerFrontPodcast.com. My name is Warren. Here what we do in the Downer Front Podcast is that we review movies, TV shows, and do a bunch of different hilarious uh, outtakes and videos all over a uh, beverage of our choosing. And tonight we are going to be doing a full review of Black Klansmen. One of the newest films from Spike Lee. So I'm super pumped to actually talk about this. We have two of my best friends, so I actually am going to introduce them. The beautiful mouth of the South. Brylan, how's it going, man? What have you been drinking and what you watching? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. It's good to be back after being really sick for a while. Uh, What I'm drinking right now is Gatorade, the fruit punch flavor, because that's the only flavor Gatorade I like. Um, It keeps the electrolytes in you. Keeps you energetic, so I'll be strong Excuse through me. the night. What is, what is Gatorade Fruit Punch? You mean Gatorade Red? Yeah, the red color. <laughs> it's I, called. I saw this meme the other day that was just like, if anyone refers to Gatorade as by an actual fruit, they are definitely an undercover cop. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, dude. It's not like Gatorade's an illegal substance or anything. No, but anyone who's just like, I'll have Gatorade Riptide is definitely a cop. That's light blue. Light blue. <laughs> That's light blue. Uh, but uh, maybe the NFL will consider it a controlled substance at one time or a performance enhancer. <laughs> yeah, I heard Tom Brady drink some Gatorade one time. <laughs> yeah. Suspended for four games. Yeah. But uh, what I've been watching is the new Netflix Matt Groening animated series, Disenchantment. I got to watch the entire series while I was in bed. And um, I would say if you're a hardcore Simpsons fan or Futurama fan, you probably watch this just to enjoy the similarities that it has for those uh, for those shows. But I did. I was kind of disappointed in it. It doesn't really pick up till like the second half of the season. And it feels like uh, just the throwaway jokes that were left in the writing room for like a Futurama episode placed in a medieval setting. It definitely looks pretty. It's definitely animated really well, but it just, the humor just falls a little flat too much. And it's very uh, random, kind of like how Family Guy runs, which I found kind of weird. But you do have some good voice actors like Eric Andre and um, the British guy from. uh, the IT crowd that was like head of the uh, company, he's hilarious in it. Every time he shows up, I hear his voice and I'm like, yeah, he's he's a crazy dude. I love him. Yeah, I mean, I tried to uh, start watching that show and I was curious to be looking at like just the marketing. And the only thing I saw was right before it came out. Um, I think like maybe a day or two before they had uh, showed like a really quick sort of teaser um, kind of trailer for it. And I was like, uh, I don't know what this is. And it was apparently for that show. And I was like, oh, when is that out? And it was like, oh, tomorrow. I was like, man, you need to do a really a better job at that because nobody else is going to be like <laughs> looking or randomly looking at that. And I think I was watching TV. So it actually wasn't even like um, being ads in the Netflix. But I see that Netflix started to uh, splice in their ads as you're binge watching shows. So have you uh, seen that yet? Have you guys experienced that? I haven't experienced that yet because for some reason, whenever I go to the next episode, I get like an error. And so I just have to go back to the episode list and start the next episode. I haven't haven't seen it yet. And I'm not going to fix it because I like it better that way. (laughs) I haven't seen it yet, but uh, I'm kind of binging in slow motion. So I don't know if that affects anything. And thanks, Brylan. As always, it's lovely to see your beautiful face. Uh, His uh, counterpart, his... uh, partner in crime we have the michael mr shredder blew it blew it what you uh sipping on or what you been watching oh, yeah he is my sherlock to my dumbass so uh i think we're doing things um so what i've been watching i finally finished drugs inc and by finished i mean napped the entire way through it uh it is my nap. so 
I actually need you, the loyal down in front supporter, uh, singular Ryan Dowd, to tweet at us and tell us what I should nap through in the future. I'm thinking dope. It's also on Netflix and Netflix original, but I just need something that's not engaging enough to actually pay attention to, but engaging enough to fall asleep to and actually want to watch. Uh, please add us. Is that what they say? The youth. As for what I've been watching, uh, I've been checking out the new Dancing with the Stars Star Wars edition. Uh, it's been pretty solid. Uh, I really respect the show for the ability to show differently abled bodies in an athletic way. Um, considering one of the contestants is like 85% prosthetics, uh, an old war hero, if you will. Um, really seeing Darth Vader do the uh, Lambada, I believe it's called, uh, was was a, was amazing to watch. Um, also, d- speaking of, again, differently abled bodies, seeing someone like Jabba the Hutt, who has no definition in his lower body, he just literally looks like a slug down there. Um, see him s- salsa across the dance floor was remarkable. Uh, I mean, the pretty boy Han Solo is probably going to get it. Maybe a little bit of... Uh, a little bit of fireworks between him and that Princess Leia, if you know what I mean. But, uh, you know, it's really interesting to watch. Who wrote this, by the way? I didn't watch a single thing of that. Why is this on the cue card? I just was <laughs> going to read what was in front of me, jackasses. I mean, that sounds pretty amazing. Uh, Blue, what you been drinking? Beer. I was trying to go, like, a tie-in, but I really couldn't find a company that was willing to name their, their beer after, like, a racist epitaph. Uh, that would have, that would have been uh, ballsy. It probably wouldn't have worked out for them. Cotton. Is that a racist joke? (laughs) (laughs) White. Uh, Oh, white. I mean, you can always get, we can, uh, you could have made yourself a Negroni. (laughs) Oh God. I don't think I can say that. (laughs) Or get a Negro Modelo. (laughs) Nope. That's still something I I can't. The, the Irish part of me is just like far too white. (laughs) <laughs> well, uh, Blue, it is always great to see your face, so I'm excited to uh, get your thoughts uh, on Black Klansmen. Uh, my name is Warren, and uh, I am currently sipping on a glass of Apothic Dark. Pretty standard stuff, nothing crazy. I also have, in the spirit of this movie, I have the Gatorade White. You basically can't even see it in the camera. So, it's uh, pretty delicious. Uh, and it tastes like privilege, so that's pretty cool. Uh, so, uh, what, uh, what I've been watching. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, shit. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> uh, man. So, what, I, what I've been watching is, uh, you know, Blue, to talk about your uh, show that you probably should be watching. Uh, if you want to go to sleep to, definitely go check out. Yeah, I would definitely watch uh, Mr. Rogers. That is probably the best show to fall asleep to. It's pretty soothing. It's amazing, and you get you, you learn so much. So it's pretty amazing. So definitely do that. I have been watching a bunch of shows, but I would say the biggest thing I do want to talk about is the newest movie with Mr. Jason Statham, who he punches a shark, called The Meg. And guys, spoilers. This movie is actually quite enjoyable. Arguably, I would say this this is the best movie since Jaws. Shark movie since Jaws. And somebody says, that's not saying a lot. And I said, shut your mouth. Because there's been so many other shark movies that's basically made the uh, genre pretty terrible, I think. And Finding Nemo. That's not a shark movie. You shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> that, not even close. Anyways. Uh, yeah, I definitely would say definitely go check out uh, The Mag. It's actually a lot of fun. I felt like the movie that knew what it was talking about, it has some co- comedic sort of parts into it, as well as some action. And it really felt like they set it up, you know the why behind it they didn't have like an evil mastermind they just didn't they didn't do all the silly things of why people usually would hate movies uh and so i think i enjoyed it a lot so I, i'm assuming that movie's probably going to make bank probably worldwide i'm gonna guess maybe 750 million maybe more because everybody's probably gonna like that movie and i think it's like the perfect summer movie although it came out pretty close to the end of the summer but it is gonna be a kind of a perfect summer movie so definitely go check that out 
So we are pumped. Uh, what we usually would do is that uh, we would normally kind of ask a particular question before, but we're actually going to get right into this actual review. I'm excited because we have a lot of thoughts about it. So definitely go check this out. We are about to approach our spoiler section. So if you have not seen Black Klansman, so it's from the director Spike Lee, this is going to be the section to take a pause. Go watch the movie. Come back and pick up right here. We will see you soon for a full review of Black Klansman. back and we are the down in front podcast tonight we are reviewing i have brylin i have blew it we are going to be reviewing black klansman newest movie and newest film by uh spike lee scott lee what no spike lee i'm we're going to be talking about this in a couple different sections so we kind of broke it up and talked about the actors and the characters then we're going to go over to like the plot uh sort of the portrayal of like the police force in general so a little bit of parallels between what was actually shown in the movie itself and then we'll probably end it off looking at some visual style before we get into our lasting thoughts but we are in the actual spoiler section so if you have not seen black Klansmen, we are going to spoil the movie for you we're going to give all the plot points away so you definitely want to make sure to hit pause go check out the movie because you definitely it's a good movie so definitely go check it out come back pick up where we left off and let's go from there so as always i want to start with the beautiful brylin and brylin talk to me about the characters in the uh acting of this movie yeah, so I'm going to start off with our main character, um, Ron Stallworth, played by uh, John David Washington, who I did not recognize was Ricky from Ballers, which makes me excited because he does, a, I think, an incredible performance here. Um, if you Have any of you young gentlemen seen Blazing Saddles? I, I don't think I actually have, sadly. It's the funniest movie that was ever made, and a movie like that will never get made again. But I stand by that is the funniest yes. movie ever made. Me too. I agree with that. And his his portrayal of Ron Stallworth in here, because they do set it up to be kind of like this, biting crim- criticism with a lot of humoristic wit in it, um, it reminds me a lot of what Clavon Little did in... Blazing Saddles, where he's the smartest guy in the room. He's so smooth and so uh, charming that he just makes everybody else look super dumb. And it's only like the people closest to him in this whole sting operation to unveil any criminal activity by the Ku Klux Klan um, that him and Adam Driver come out as like a really great pairing on the police force to make this happen. But he also is able to approach uh, like racial, racial tensions while on the police force. And I think in a very rational, realistic way as well. He, I mean, it's not that he's safe and secure or wins the day, but it's actually approached very realistically by him to say, you know what? Uh, There's a lot of crap in the world and we deal with a, Bad hand uh, right here dealt with us in a lot of oppression systemically as well as just just some people that hate us for the fear of wanting to take things away from them, which isn't even a rational fear mm-hmm. that he approaches like, well, you know what? I'm a cop. I've always wanted to be a cop. Let me see what good I can do with this little bit I have. And I enjoyed every single moment he was on the screen and every single moment he was interacting with the uh, other actors that were uh, he was with. Um, I'd say, did any of y'all want to mention anything about John David Washington? Yeah, I'm glad, be- I'm glad I kind of went into this movie. Um, this is like even more sort of unspoiled, like unsullied, like completely non. Like I had no idea what this movie was about, um, but I also didn't know, you know, besides Adam Driver, I didn't know who that was in this movie. And I'm so glad that I went into this movie not knowing that he was Denzel Washington's son. That I think right there 
really helped me enjoy this movie and enjoy his role a lot because now that I know that information, that is all that I can actually see. I've seen interviews, I've seen him talk, and that's all I see. That and his mannerisms of how he's talking, how he brings things up, and how he kind of like interviews and answer questions. I'm like, holy crap, that dude is like a, a spitting image of Denzel Washington. It's scary, but I'm glad that. Um, he's kind of stepping out of his own shadow. I think he's always has been, but he's now getting um, more of a popular role that uh, is depicted of you know something that's actually happening in society today. So I I did enjoy his character. I, I kind of wanted a bit more from his character because it definitely felt like some things kind of went to the wayside. Um, and as we had talked about earlier this year, Brylin, you know, talking about sorry to bother you and talking about the fact that. We put on this so-called like white voice to help with sales, and that's something that doesn't quite kind of come back, and it, we don't really actually see the impact of what that happens with this character. So I thought that was an interesting choice. Um, so I kind of wanted something more along the lines of you know exactly what he's doing and his actions, like how is that affecting him? And it, it doesn't really seem like he was uh, kind of torn between being a cop in a society where. You know, in the time in which cops were either crooked or racist or, you know, cr- committing also hate crimes, kind of supporting that stuff. So I think I wanted to see a bit more from that end. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's a good point to like kind of want a little bit more out of that. But um, I think the purpose of his role was to make sure that um, he was that even though there's all this shit around me on the police force, that. I'm not going to let it phase me. And there are moments where it does phase him. So it's good to see that human part of him that like, Hey, as much as you say, you're going to be professional and do your job that like, uh, like that scene, the evidence room where they're all saying like, uh, can you get me this document for this toad? And they use that term toad, which I'd never heard before, Mm -hmm. which I don't think they use just necessarily for perps, but it was also for, uh, minority perps as well. So they would, uh, They'd use that because he is actually doing that job there. Uh, and I think that even though he deals with that shit and he deals with it to a point where it's like, you know what? I can't stand, especially with one cop, I can't stand this shit anymore. But he continues to keep focus on the mission at hand that he's actually developed once he gets on the intelligence department, which I think is kind of like the lesson that his character is trying to put out there that. You need to, even though there's going to be a lot of shit around you, if you're in a position where you can affect change or try to do at least one step forward, keep with that mission and keep that focus. Uh, so uh, Laura Harrier, uh, who's Liz from Spider-Man Homecoming, Did not uh, she's that. amazing at this and she's totally unrecognizable as well uh, as Patrice, who is uh, head of the um, the Black Panther Student Council at her university. Um, and I don't know if it's the Black Student Council at our university and they just work with the Black Panthers for protection or anything, uh, or they are Black Panthers, a Black Panther group on the university. It, I guess it's just grasping at straws and stuff. doesn't really matter mm-hmm. in this case. But uh, if you were talking about Sorry to Bother You, I found her to be like a more realistic, more rational version of Detroit. Absolutely. And I found that her discussions, her conversations – where it was just like, if it was just like uh, when uh, Ron comes up to her and he's just automatically just picks her out of a crowd and just starts um, sweet talking her and stuff. And she's like, all right, this guy's pretty fun and stuff. Uh, but it also is good to see like what she cares about in life and that she's passionate about that, which is a different approach to trying to overcome these obstacles that Ron has. And it's good to see their differences in opinion that you have uh, civil conversation around, hey, we both want to actually make the, the world a better place, but we're approaching it from two different ways. And is that going to clash or is that going to be something where we can um, overcome like the differences and just kind of work together, but on different paths at the same time? So I thought that was a diff- that was an interesting conflict that they brought up with her and Ron's character as well. Can we just... And it's just... Yeah. Can we remark the ultimate wingman in this movie? Legit, he shows up, says hello to uh, uh, Laura Harrier's character, and the dude with the chick that she was with is like, oh yeah, 
he seems all right. Let's go somewhere else. And he just he grabs his girlfriend and they just get out of there. That is the ultimate wingman. <laughs> Seriously, you'll never find a better one. Like you don't know this person and they're like, "All right, he's she's single, he seems to be single. Let's get out of here." I mean, that's bravo. <laughs> bro bro fist bump or if you're Fox News, terrorist fist, fist bump uh nice. to that guy. <laughs> Man, I didn't realize this is going to be such a political podcast today. Oh, yeah. I already yeah. told people that the amount of DAS racist uh, subfolder that I'm going to have for this episode is going to be insane. Oh, no. <laughs> I thought it was cool to talk about the Laura, Laura Harrier's character. And um, I I think a lot of them, a lot of this movie, and it probably because, you know, Sorry to Bother You came out so recently, um, within the last what, month, month and a half of us kind of talking and then me watching this movie. But I, I just felt there was so many different, uh, so many similarities from those movies and there so many different parallels, especially what was trying to be portrayed that I couldn't help but compare it. And, you know, I, I definitely know it's not fair to kind of compare one movie to the next. But when I saw her character, I was like, oh, man, I would love the Detro- Detroit character in Sorry to Bother You. That movie on its own was very, very quirky and creative and very different. Whereas if you pluck her out of this movie and place her into a more um, structured or more uh, normal, quote unquote, movie that we normally would see, then you actually would get this character. So that's a good characterization. That's a good call out, Brylin. Um, of what she was trying to do and I also like the fact that she wasn't scared to do it she wasn't afraid about it and she also kind of spoke her mind about just about anything and I really think that a lot of her dialogue in this movie was really really powerful um, but I think it, it, it also it, it becomes just dialogue and it's like okay that's what she kind of believes but I think a lot of people like a lot of her dialogue and a lot of stuff that she was believing was almost kind of feeling like well this is how black people in that time was feeling and she's talking to a black guy who doesn't get it and so i think there's a whole different dynamic that was happening inside there a lot in this movie that things were just kind of bouncing off of ron um that i think that was another case to be made of you know that's it that's an effective i think that's effective writing right that's effective storytelling but it's also effective dialogue and acting so kudos to her i i never got the the feeling that Ron didn't get where she was coming from. I think he totally understood it. Uh, and it was just a matter that she wants to take her approach of changing the system versus he wants to keep the system in place and weed out the bad guys. And I think that's where the conflict is between them. And I feel that it was handled very maturely and very um, rational that they both understood what each one was going for. It's just a matter of like, which path do we take to actually get the result we want? Yeah. And I think it's great that they leave that kind of uh, up in the air at the end, but also they show them also working together at the end at the same time as well. Well, so this, I think, I feel like that's a, uh, this is basically my only point on characterization here is that one thing I loved is that this movie was a snapshot of some people. And you didn't get the background on the Black Panthers. You didn't get where they were coming from. You didn't get her real life lived experience versus what she'd been told. You know, you didn't get his lived experience. You didn't, you literally knew nothing about our main character. You just see him show up at a police station one day. You don't understand if he's experienced racist, racism and wants to change it. If he's, you know, more of like, for lack of a better term, kind of like a you know, like an Uncle Tom Tom character where he's, like, completely bought in with white people and, like, accepts this whole systematic racism type thing. Uh, you, you don't understand the police force, you know, and these characters that either seem to accept uh, Ron versus don't accept him. Like, it's, it's such a microcosm film, and I think that they play that off so unbelievably well, where, like... There is such a moral ambiguity to every single person in this film that you don't know if they're going to break, when they're going to break, and if they don't break, what happens? You know, like, I kept on waiting this entire time uh, for Ron to, like, absolutely just lose it, you know, and, like, to absolutely go on a diatribe on how, like, racism is terrible and, like, how all these people are messing up and stuff. And it never happens, you know, it never, he, he never goes full Black Panther. And so he just leaves it as this weird, ambiguous character who is definitively just, just good, 
but also you don't know his true motivation, which is bad. You know what I mean? Like it's 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 his intentions are good unequivocally, mm-hmm. but because you can't understand him as a person, it someone makes it like a little bit off putting. You know, like if you the one of you guys did something out of character, I'd be like, that's messed up. Because I feel like I know you. We've been working together and doing this podcast and friends in general for years at this point. Um, we only had two hours to get to know Ron. Yeah. And I feel like we didn't understand a single one of the characters. And that was perfect for me. Like, it just gave this weird little thing. Because I think the wrap-up point on this one is that that echoes. So a lot of times when people are... T- like any sort of artistic endeavor, literature, film, music, doesn't matter. You try and take something that is from the past or the future and then try and shuttle it into the mainstream of like what's going on right now. And because it's easier for people to disambiguate from something that is current events and then really kind of get into something that was 30 years in the past or 30 years in the future. Uh, I don't know why it happens. I'm not a psychologist, but I think it's it's just easier. And so I think the, the, the great thing about that is that we got a microcosm of these characters that every single one of them you could find a relation to in that circumstance. Uh, I really hope it's not a neo-Nazi relationship to it, but technically it's there. Um, and then you could understand the story in 1972 what two or 79 that they're trying to portray and then also how it relates to modern day politics without actually until the last five minutes going into the modern day and i thought that was freaking brilliant from spike lee yeah, sorry the- rant rant over that wasn't <laughs> even all characters but like i thought that was the, the most important thing that it was so ambiguous on who they were as people that it really tied into how it was then, how it was before then, and how it is now, and how it will be in the future. I think that's an interesting call out because I think one of the like yeah. one of my negatives about it, and I know Bradley, you're going to start talking about Adam Driver, a character's flip, is in the movie. You know, there's writing and there's scenarios and situations where you can kind of see things that are affecting him as a character, him being Jewish. But he didn't you know, like. That's how that's how people view him as. But that's not how he views himself. Um, and I think the movie took uh, was pretty cool of kind of slowing down that in not flushing out, but they they definitely kind of like displayed that as uh, an issue, and you can see that it's like affecting him as an actual character. And then there's things that are portrayed in the movie for Ron. Uh, of him as a as a as a black guy, and you know even his co- conversations with David Duke, and how him as a being a police officer, knowing that his quote unquote brothers, right, and police are still committing kind of hate crimes to his his girl or their friends, it it just felt like they had more focus on certain like other characters, although we don't know who they are, but there was scenes and the moments and shots that kind of slowed down for, uh, his, uh, like, you know, flips character and, uh, um, uh, Laura Harrier's character. But it felt like some of the other ones for Ron just kind of went to the wayside for me. And that was just kind of, that's what I was kind of alluding to from before. But, um, yeah, I was just kind of, it's just kind of a bummer for me, uh, cause it looks like it was there in the movie in certain elements, but it wasn't in other elements. And I was kind of confused why. Bradley, what you got about Adam Driver? Yeah, it's just understandable. Absolutely. Uh, Adam Driver is flip. I mean, Adam Driver continues to show like this just natural knack to be an every man and just has a great delivery of whatever he's going to say. I mean, he he's definitely someone where you we we're introduced to him as he's a um, vice cop that goes undercover and he's pretty much someone that's just like what's the job all right I'll go and do it. He doesn't really care about the consequences or anything at the beginning, and it's really cool to see his character like journey uh, through like when he starts to get involved in in, in the uh, clan group in Colorado Springs that he has this great conversation with uh, Ron in the uh, evidence room where he's talking about like, um, you know what? I never thought about my Jewish heritage or anything, but the more and more I talk to these people that are just hating on all these races for whatever try to logic, they try to force down themselves, their minds in like this 
essentially brainwashing that they're going through to uh, where he says, like, now I can't I can't stop thinking about rituals and heritage and uh, different things. And I want to know, like, how much of Adam Driver's lines are improv because I feel like he's just pulling them out of the his the top of his head when he's talking to the Klansmen, whenever they're, they're like denying him. Like when Felix says like, Hey, show me your dick. So you're not Jewish. Like what he says back to him, I'm not going to repeat it, but it's like perfect. Like the perfect retort that you would have for, um, that type of character. And I just loved every moment that he was just diving more into this, uh, clan group and seeing like, all right, are these just a bunch of idiots that are just, spousing uh, racism or are they someone we need to actually keep an eye on to see do are, are they dangerous and everything and you get to he gets to like uh, hone in on like oh there's some former military guys here oh they got some weapons oh they're planning something big so it's really cool to see uh, how they actually go through that process of finding through Adam Driver what is the reason they should be continuing to watch the clan? Because it actually starts very ambiguous, but they definitely they find a mission to actually try to uh, stop them from doing. I love that quote, and I love that conversation that they were having as you know Ron being a black man and um, Flip or uh, Adam Driver character being sort of like Jewish of like how, how he was kind of raised, but he didn't quite kind of believe in it. Because I, I and I love those lines that you were kind of talking about, Brylin, of you know I didn't like I don't see myself as that, but everybody else sees me as that. And now I'm, it's a constant reminder every day, every time I look up. And and I think, you know, Blue, you were alluding to this before, but I don't think this was as subtle um, jabs, right? I don't think this was as subtle things that was uh, things that were being brought up and being talked about from the society today. I thought it was pretty literal, like pretty like on the nose, like being very direct of this is what we literally are doing. And at the end of the movie, they literally says, if you didn't get it from what this movie just was about, we're going to show you like a piece of what well, we were talking yeah. about. I think, the, last, you know? the last five minutes were yeah. just like... That was like, yeah. That yeah, was, that was, but yeah, I, I mean, going through different. the bulk of the movie was a little bit... It, it was a like, people were ambiguous. Like Ron was just not some Black Panther stand-in who was trying to be a cop. You know, like yeah. he was. I don't think a, he was there supposed was, to be. Though. I think he was supposed to be a, a little gray area, and I thought it was interesting to right. have Ron as a black character who, at that time, black people and police hated each other, but who really wanted to be a police officer and definitely kind of worked his way up from that. Still holding on to his ideals, but still battling between police are good, but not everybody's good. And, and like I think he was like smack dab in the middle of being that character of blurring the lines. So I, I, I like that element of his character and how it was written. Um, so yeah. I thought that was yeah, his interview process is fantastic, where the uh, chief of police is give them like these very like safe questions about how do you feel like you'd be as a police officer? Why do you think it'd be good on the force? And then, um, and then, uh, Oh, I forget his name. Isaiah, Isaiah Whitlock from the wire. He just like cuts right to the core. Like, how do you feel if someone called you this? Yeah. <laughs> I love the fact that also, if you watch the wire, you would see that he's like, she, <laughs> yeah. I was like, that's so, so great. <laughs> so good. so I, I would like to, I was thinking about this. I didn't think about it in pre-production, but the, the dichotomy that existed between Adam driver and, uh, Ron, where they, um, one lived as a voice over the telephone with very obvious, like being black is an outward thing, you know, like, that's just you're not white like that's different yeah. um whereas adam driver's character flip he was the real life person with a hidden minority status you know like you can't necessarily tell a, a white person as jewish um you know just by looking at them and i thought that was a great great dichotomy where you kind of like got them to play off each other on what is hidden versus what is, you know, in the public and how do you kind of deal with that? Uh, and I thought that, like, a lot of it was subservient to each other. You know, like, they kind of bounced back and forth. Uh, one would echo, like, this very public thing and then one would echo this very private thing. 
um, and to see them kind of play off that was was pretty interesting. I didn't. I, this is not fully developed, I don't think, but um, I guess I'd like to hear from you as the viewers on what you think or listeners on what you think about. Uh, and we got to get you know. I, I, this is this is like half baked right now, but I think it's it's true. Where like again, being outwardly black versus inwardly Jewish, and then interacting with someone who is a white supremacist who hates e- both parties equally mm-hmm. um, was fascinating to me. Yeah, I thought it was, and I, and I, and I like yeah. again. I think things that made it interesting um, and things that made it, you know, you have in the theater they call it these archetype sort of characters and you have these particular kind of roles that are supposed to have like maybe one or two things and everything else is a mystery about them so you know a couple things about these characters and you you had talked about this earlier blew it i think that's what makes this movie so engaging to watch we know one or two things about ron we know one or two things about flip and as the movie progresses, we slowly start learning more and more and it seems as though they're also learning or at least realizing or coming to terms with more and more stuff, especially Flip's character being around and infiltrating the white supremacists and going through all the rituals and going through everything. Although it was a lie, he literally had to like say those words and do those things. And so it's, you know, I, I think that was it, uh, visually, and I think we'll talk about it a little bit later, but like visually and how it was being portrayed, I thought that was a really, really cool take to really kind of you know, take some time for everybody, right? You watch this movie, you take some time and you figure out, you know, how did this affect you? How, how was it seeping in? And what do you think you would do in that scenario or situation? Uh, yeah. So I think, um, just to talk about some of the Klansmen now, um, I really liked, uh, Topher Grace's portrayal as David Duke, even though it's, uh, it's set up to be kind of cartoonish and silly. And I think that's done on purpose just to kind of, uh, elevate like, the philosophy and the ethos behind the clan is all pretty much based on false print pretenses. Like this whole thing, like, Oh, black people are going to steal your women. They're going to take your jobs. They're going to take your land. It's all, uh, just fairy dust and not real. And it's, uh, based on fear and hate of just like thinking you're going to lose what you already have. And David Duke is kind of the personification of that at this point. Um, and so I think he does a solid job of just like carrying that. Uh, I think also uh, Alec Baldwin should get a mention because he has this opening scene the where he plays this guy called Dr. Kennebrew Beauregard, which is the dumbest name ever. If he was a real person, um, I think it's an important scene because it kind of sets up the tone of the movie for the rest of the time. You see, he's trying to give this speech. He's a doctor of neuroscience, this speech about how the black man is uh, lower than the white person. They, and it's all cut back where he's standing in front of this uh, movie. I think it's gone with the wind that's showing just like a lot of injured Confederate soldiers. And he's, making these weird like mouth ticks and everything because he keeps on messing up his lines because they're recording it as propaganda and so you have him like say things like ba 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 mwah mwah and like it's just hilarious to watch him try to get this out that he's like hey maybe he's not uh he's sold he's definitely sold on like this philosophy he has but he's like kind of approaching it in a very goofy way as well and i think it's important to have those kind of cartoony attributes of the clan in the movie because we do get two characters I think are really serious which are uh, Felix and his wife um, Connie that yeah you you meet them and you're like oh they're just a bunch of dumb rednecks and everything but when you start to learn more about these characters they are very dangerous and because they are bought in whole hog into this philosophy that the clan has that where their pillow talk at night is all about like their dream of doing this incredible wrong or this justice as they call it towards black people and this big plan they have. And Connie's just so eager to serve the cause and that it's heartbreaking at times that you see this person that is just totally awash in this uh, ideology of fear and hate that she wants to do something very evil towards other people. And it become makes the movie go from this very humorous satire approach to like, hey, now we're in some serious business. There's some real stakes at hand now. And they do a great job of changing that intensity in the movie when the plan of the clan starts to actually 
be formulated a bit more and you start to see clearly what it is, which makes David Duke's appearance at Colorado Springs feel like, oh, that basically Satan has arrived in Colorado Springs rather than, oh, this goofy cartoonish character because you start to see how he reacts around black people. You start to see how much he's involved and how much he takes in the ceremony and the circumstance or this uh, this uh, ritual that the clan has as well and just how they're, he, they're just feeding off of each other to just be even more hateful. And it does make it, it's a really cool way that Spike Lee approaches that, I think. I, I do want to ask this. Has anyone ever seen... Uh, has anyone ever seen David Duke and Topher Grace in the same room? <laughs> Jeez, I don't know. So I, don't, they, I don't like this going. No, no, no. So, well, no. <laughs> I mean, it's a funny comment, but like, I had, I'd never. Fun fact: uh, I've never listened to David Duke talk ever. I mean, I know the name. I like, I know who he is as a person, but I've never seen him. I've never heard his words. Uh, when they cut to him at the end of this movie blew my mind how close Topher Grace was. Like, in looks, in, in in tone of voice, in word choice, like... And most of that was just still... Still Eric Foreman. Like, so David Duke, white supremacist, <laughs> is just basically like a 10-year-old version... Or 10-year-older version of Eric Foreman. I really yeah. hope... I really hope the alt right like Pretty protests much. our podcast because that'd be <laughs> so funny. <laughs> but yeah, uh, to- Topher Grace was yeah. freaking phenomenal in that role. Like he, c- he completely embraced the weird um, of that character, but also impre- embraced the gravity of that character. Like if you took that out of real life and didn't make it a real life person, David Duke is an, a ridiculous human being. But it, he gave it gravity by grounding it in reality. Because that scene heavily weighed on me of how well that it was performed with Connie in um, Felix in in bed talking about like their Felix, yeah. yeah, Felix, right, yeah, Connie and Felix, and talking about like their biggest dreams of what they want to do are talking about committing hate crimes and how that is like that's their life goal almost. Um, but then, like you, it, it, it's just such a different. It's it's just so layered. I was like, man, I feel so like uncomfortable and like angry, but then like sad. But damn, they did a good job. But then you think there's such a weird complex of emotions of like that sequence alone, because it's such it's so heartbreaking to be like, man, people. Uh, I was gonna say used to be like that. People are like that, right? You just substitute like the word black people for like whatever other person yeah. you want to say, right? And people are still to this day like that, and it's a bit heartbreaking. Um, and you know, these are some of the not so subtle things of, there's a lot of different language that they talked about the president. There's a lot of different languages that they used in this movie that it's like, it, it, like you can, it's not all always like, even if this movie was literally about black people, because it was called the black Klansman, um, it still talks about, you know, the overall why people need to hate people. Like you don't need to do it. And so that scene was like very, very powerful. And it, like, definitely made an impression on me. Yeah. I would say another powerful scene that uh, I thought was amazing was uh, the scene playing during um, when the clan are having their ritual is the Black Panthers listening to uh, Jerome Turner, played by Harry Belafonte. Mm. And it's good to see Harry Belafonte. He is a legend. And he brought all the uh, emotion and just the uh, power you needed in that scene to make it work. So... Um, great job by him. And uh, last person I'll mention is like uh, Flip's partner looked kind of like Steve Buscemi. Funny thing, he's Steve Buscemi's brother. <laughs> I thought that was great. <laughs> I saw that. I was like, oh no way! Oh yeah, you kind of look at it. Oh okay, cool. <laughs> I still think that role should have been Steve Buscemi. Like, I'm pretty sure. I still to this day. I think that was supposed to be Steve Buscemi. But um, going off of some of your thoughts here, Bryland of. Um, Obviously, I'm going to be agreeing with you. The couple things that I wouldn't necessarily add, you know, there's another character. Um, so this was played by uh, Corey Hawkins. So he played Kwame Ture, brother Kwame Ture, or Ture, and he has that speech at the you know the Black Panthers rally that 
you know, I think I, I may allude to this one a little bit later on, but like the visual elements of that speech, but how powerful that speech was um, about just kind of giving hope. And, um, you know, he talks about a lot about like kind of rising up. And I think during that sequence and during that scene, like you can see uh, people's faces what were appearing, right, as a solid black a background, but then people's faces would appear as they're kind of talking to those people. And then you see Rod, it has, it slowly seems to be like, it, I, I felt like things were kind of seeping in and seeping in, I thought, right? It, it doesn't look like it was, but it definitely felt like things were affecting him. Uh, and that will probably be like another, like one of the other powerful scenes that I would talk about this a lot. I mean, that sequence and i think this movie kept doing it a lot of they would do some comical there was something a bit more lighter and they would kind of change a bit of a genre and the style of the movie but then it would like definitely kind of zero in and kind of focus on some of these moments and the moment with harry um harry balafonte and then the moment with you know Corey hawkins character and then the moment with felix and connie in bed like there's a lot of different things that continue to keep happening because it like, Hey, this is really happening. Right. I think they want to make, they want to have a message even at the end. Right. The, the, I wouldn't call it a montage, but the showing of what, you know, what happened in, uh, Virginia. Uh, and so it's just like these things, like the, I think they, there was a purpose. I'm curious to like time these out in the movie, by the way, but, um, like these things were a purpose. And I think that was like very, very impactful. Um, so it's pretty cool. Yeah, and the Kwame Ture speech is cool because it's not just about like uh, anti-governmental system or and or po- very political. It's also about like what does it mean to be a proud black person mm-hmm. uh, in America? How are you going to? What is your? What are you fighting for? Kind of thing. Where like if you ever like if we took a real life situation, if you ran into someone like. That if you ever run into someone that's saying, like, why do people are all passionate about this Black Lives Matter movement or anything like that? Why does it matter so much that his whole reason about, like, why what's beautiful for a black person is totally different than for a white person? Because hair is different. Skin's different. It is it is difference, but it's also something that needs to be given same consideration as well. That like if you, during that time in the seventies you probably had a bunch of black kids and they're like I want a Barbie doll and their parents probably bought them a white Barbie doll that doesn't look like them at all mm-hmm. and so what type of message is that sending to that kid and there was even like a test uh, like a psychologist did something like that it's like they had a bunch of black kids get in a room and said like all right pick the doll you think is beautiful and they always would pick the white doll yep. So they didn't even have a realization of what black beauty is. You know, talking about black beauty, beauty, talking about pride, I think the speech itself is instilling confidence, right? It's extending pride. It's it's instilling the fact that you have to be proud of who you are as human nature. You be proud. Like he, he says it a lot of being proud, like, ri- like rising up, meaning, you know, take take um you know, put more action to yourself like feel free to like love yourself for who you are and what you look like um and i love that you know this movie picks you up and, it, and it's definitely supposed to be more motivating and it's definitely supposed to be more along the lines for that because then you know right after it goes into like a celebration of soul and dance and choreography and this beautiful visual scene and sequence that uh, I just thought it was like a, just a perfect like in tandem it was like a partner a perfect partnership with like be proud for who you are this is your heritage this is who you are and I really really enjoyed that speech and I, and I think the one thing I really like about that speech is that it came so quick in the movie um, I think arguably what first twenty twenty five minutes of the movie uh, we got that speech um, and so I I thought that was a really really nice touch to where the movie went from after that. Uh, it's always like a nice reminder that says that, you know, love yourself, right? Like, especially for you as a black person. And although the world may not necessarily say that they like you or they like who, what you look like, you know, don't don't worry about it. Like, you be proud of yourself and be proud for who you are. And so I really, really took that away from this movie. Yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, so let's talk about a little bit of the plot. So I know I had a couple of different kind of subcategories for this. So I do want to overall talk about the plot, you know, how the movie was actually kind of paced and different kind of portrayals of a bit more of the characterization into it and how you felt like it actually kind of went through knowing that this movie was based on a you know true story. Uh, Brylon, what you got? Yeah, so um, full disclosure, I haven't seen a Spike Lee film since Do the Right Thing. And this reminded me that he is an amazing visual storyteller. So there are a lot of these elements that uh, just bring out uh, some really cool scenes and just add more to it because of how he sets up the shot. Like we talk about the speech of Kwame Ture, one like skill he uses is like this draping everybody in kind of like this stage lighting whenever they're listening to Kwame Ture and hearing his words that just shows like an inspirational image every time they hear it. And it actually is very effective every single time you see it. Uh, he also uh, harkens back to movies of the seventies as well. I love like when Patrice and Ron are walking down the boardwalk and they're talking about uh, their favorite black exploitation films, like to rather be a pimp or a private detective type of thing because they're talking about shaft and they're talking about superfly but what's really cool about that is that's like that scene is pretty much filmed just like ordinary people which was a very popular movie at that time where you see two white people walking down the street talking about like their favorite things and just to like have that juxtaposition where it's like hey black people are normal people too talking about normal things as well so it was really cool that they actually set the shot up like that um I do like um, that. I well, you mentioned like they didn't really explore uh, the systemic uh, like bigotry and racism on the police force. They kind of made it like this one character that is the racist cop on the force. And then when Ron talks to Flip and his partner about it, who he think he trusts a little bit at this time, they say like, you know what? Cops are brotherhood. And yeah, we got some bad eggs and we got to deal with it on our own terms. And that's very true to life. Even to this day for all the cops that I've known and hung out with, that's a code of like fraternal code that cops will never break. If, no matter how despicable the person next to them they are, they're working with, whether like they're being racist or they're doing terrible things to animals if they're bored for a night shift or something. Yeah, that person's a horrible human being. He will get his comeuppance, but we got to pick and choose when the police are going to deal with it. And it's not like, and for some reason, even though you're supposed to be the protectors of the law and uphold the law, and yeah, an ideal cop should follow the law as well. There is that fraternal order in pretty much every police force that's like, we're going to deal with this the way a police force would. And that's not really the code of law. It's the code of the police fraternal order. And I thought that was really realistic. It was really realistic to have that in there. Yeah, I, I, I definitely get like what you're saying. And I... Like, I understand what he was kind of going through, but I guess my issues with – I have a lot of issues with this actual character that, that they ended up kind of showing because it made them feel like accessories to, hey, that's okay because we don't see them do anything. We don't see them actually take action on anything up until the very end of the movie, right, where everybody basically kind of gets them. But, you know, this stuff happened very, very early on in the movie. That occur like that occurred in the movie, and we actually see the 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 racist cop, right? And it's it, and we even see to the point where this is why Patrice was kind of nervous and kind of hesitant about it, and they actually show us a picture of it. And so then you see if all these cops know about it, but nobody's doing anything about it, that makes you guys just as bad. I fully get and I fully understand the fact that you know you be a part of a partnership, a teamship, a fraternal sort of brotherhood. Like I, I understand all of that sort of um, camaraderie when it comes with it, but you all are our accessories to it. And you know, even for this for this day for today, we talk a lot about domestic violence and people knew about it but didn't do anything about it at all, right? That's uh, I understand why you would put this in a movie, right? It's almost uh, I guess you can call it it's you know from the seventies, so they're trying to describe what happened at that time, but it also means that if you show me this in a movie. 
they are also at fault. They are also guilty. Like you're not. Like, if you guys are going to sit back, flip, and you know, other Bushimi, I can't. Remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you guys are going to sit back, even the police officer and like, I mean, even the chief. I mean, everybody in that station all knew, and it felt like it was a mo- majority of a. Oh yeah, we we knew. We'll deal with it. We kind of accept what's happening. We understand what he's doing. I'm curious. Like, I guess I don't know if I'm like putting like thoughts into my head, but there was also a, a consideration of he like shot somebody or something like that. Um, I'm not sure if that. I don't even know if that was in this movie, but it was basically that dude, like the the evil police officer. I'll look up his name in a second, but the, the fact that they all knew what was happening and we didn't, we don't physically or visually see any of them like disagreeing or going against them or helping the cause that i think posed a a pretty big problem for me so i think ron it shows at the end that that crooked cop gets his come up and so i think that's like trying to show that ron had a positive effect on the police force at the end uh and but even though like and because he earned his place, even though we see the reality when the police chief tells him that he's got to get rid of all the documents about the Klansmen because other hands have gotten involved with it. It's become more of a political matter, which is, I mean, kind of the reality that they have to deal with at times. But it's interesting to see that he goes against that rule, too, because he knows it's the wrong thing to do, which is good. But um, I like the little sting they have um, to actually capture the racist cop where... He's just hanging out in the bar with Patrice and him, and then he's just wearing a wire just so the police chief can hear it. Um, it might feel a little too tidy, uh, but it's uh, it's good to see, like, hey, let's try something else. Like you said, let's try something a little different to make it happen. I completely disagree with that, only because it glorified the fact that everybody sat around and chose not to do anything and I I think that you know if everybody was sitting here and mum's the word and they're going to turn an eye and one person's like no we should do something so I'm going to wear a wire and then everybody's going to celebrate for it it only makes it again it just perpetuates the fact that all the shit you guys were doing for all these years are wrong I can care less about what fraternal, like, what it is. At least show me, like, I need to see. That dude did so many d- disgusting and uh, wrong things to people just in this movie alone that we saw a snippet of it, but he's known for doing that. I need to see a huge kind of fallout for that actual character. Yeah. And, and, I, and it's kind of, it, it was just very frustrating that, again, you, you you call it tidy. I just call it, no, you, they, make, they played it too safe. You're telling me you're going to choose to have a story being told of Harry Belafonte about how somebody gets ha- hung in the street uh, sorry, excuse me, somebody was dragged out, beaten in the street police at that time pick, pick, picked this person up strung him, lynched him up, burned his body, and you're giving me a visual representation of that in the movie yet, for this crooked police officer cop, the only like one of the biggest villains in this movie and we put a wire and he goes to jail. That's easy. I, I was really pissed out. I was really pissed at that. That, that was, a lot. that was, I mean, that's just the, the beginning scene. of justice. though. No, that was, no, that was the worst scene in the movie because this is going to be super inflammatory, but honestly, I've never been so happy to see a cross burning in my entire life because I thought for a second that spike. Yeah, I told you, I told you it was going to be a good one. Uh, <laughs> I thought for a second that spike Lee was going to cop out and make this a happy freaking movie and have be like, oh, the racist cop gets a thing. David Duke gets punched by some anti-fascist, you know, idiot that's been like somehow 30 years before that whole movement started. It, like, you know, everything was going to wind up and go ahead. But it's like it completely counteracts the message of the movie where like we started this thing 40 years ago and we're still at the same freaking place. It's yes. just cyclically repeating. I, I freaking hated that scene. I, I seriously, I thought they were going to show like a nice scene where they were, you know, friends between uh, Flip and Ron at the end. And maybe the girlfriend was there and like, OK, we, we started to mend this because that's kind of where society is right now, where we're like a decent amount mended. But there's still these like weird racist holdouts for no reason that I, 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 I can figure out. Mm-hmm. Um 
and so I thought that's that that's where we we're going to dump us, but it gave us this like weird cathartic, just like yeah, we got the racist. Racism's yeah. racism solved. We yeah, got we're done. Him, guys. We're good. Yeah, like it's it's. I didn't get that from that oh, at all. Totally. So. Yeah, that, it, I think that totally gave that. That's exactly how no. it felt. And I think you know, as I was watching this movie, we're driving home, and Emma was like going off because it was such. Like that's how she also kind of gathered from the movie, and I think the couple of people that I've talked to so far, because arguably I don't think a lot, not many people movie saw, not many people I know so far seen this movie, but they definitely got that element from this. Is like, oh, cool, we got the only right, we got the only racist cop in this police force who just so happened to have ties to KKK. So I guess that's very convenient, right? We're good to go, we're fine. But then the movie itself. The, the, I think one of the very next scenes shows the cross burning, and in the movie we are there is a line that says there has to be a cross burning in months or something like along the lines of that, and so it ends with the cross burning, and then you get this huge um, sort of depiction of you know what's happened in Charlottesville and all, and all this shit. So I I was very very confused. I I almost would have completely cut that that scene out of the movie entirely because I just don't think it. Which it, which it scene? Had, well, the, well, I think all that scene, busting the cop, yeah, the busting the cop, and then directly kind of after that. So, so I would, you know, I I kind of didn't hate the cross burning scene. No, no, That's I a weird thing it. to say. I, I That's didn't, so I didn't, weird. I didn't hate Scrap the scene. that. Let's <laughs> let's edit that one out. No, but no, uh, I didn't hate the scene. I just hated this the the section before. Like right. I would say, with the cop being busted, copy busted, and all that shit. You need to cut that out because there was things that led. From that sequence to the cross burning, and then everything right. else after that. Yeah, no, I. I yeah, it was, it was a completely divergence of the actual movie. Great movie, by the way. Right, but and it was. Oh, see exactly. <laughs> and so it it really bo- it still bothers me because I sat there was like, this, when the fuck did this become a happy uh, like a happy? Yeah, it was never a happy movie. It, it that this doesn't make any sense of what you're trying to do. The entire components of the rest of the story that you've told so far does not match this scene at all. And then they get, you know, unless the, unless it was on purpose for them to kind of put this in the movie, that's the only reason to kind of um, you know explore the dialogue between people, but. That scene right there just didn't make any sense. It, it really, really had some big issues with that. Um, Warren, I feel like this is the first time in two years that we've agreed so, so much on that. That scene was trash. And again, uh, it was just so happy. It was like, oh, we got him, guys. We're all friends. Racism is solved. White people and black people and Jews are like, I don't think the that's the, the world. point like, of that scene at it all. It just seemed like yeah, everyone was high fiving each other like a freaking South Park scene. You know, of like, Not we got really. him, guys. We got racism. We, the- we arrested him. Well, it's take place in Colorado. No, so. I know. <laughs> Officer Barberty was there arresting racism. <laughs> and so, like, it, but it was, it, like, it was so out of place for the, you know, what we were talking about before with the moral ambiguity. Like, that scene was so much, like, so unbelievably one-sided on the we got racism that there was no sort of, there was no weirdness about that. It was just a right scene, you know? And this, the whole rest of the movie wasn't right. Well, I think that scene works because uh, we got to look at, like, how everything's connected together. So we're talking about, like, this near the ACU? end. Get out of here with <laughs> no, that. No. <laughs> Shut up. Not, like, continuity, <laughs> but, like, in, in terms of tone of how the movie is told. So... Yeah, I like that Spike Lee didn't say, like, everything sucks and everything is all, everybody's, like, there's racism everywhere. He is saying that hatred will always wear a certain face, no matter how it's clothed. And hatred will always be there, whether it's racism, prejudice, anti-religion. It's always going to be there, no matter what you do. And I think that's why that scene is important to show him, hey, we did complete this one little thing little drop in the bucket one minor baby step but then after that you see a cross burning before that you see connie go to plan b with the bomb because she couldn't fit the bomb in the mailbox for whatever reason so she left and so she actually put the bomb under patrice's car and then she ends up blowing up felix who is the love of her life and a lot of other clansmen but she still gets arrested as a criminal and that the whole thing with that is during that time you do see Ron try to stop her 
and he gets taken down by two cops. They're like, there's no way you're a cop. You're a black guy. They take him down and they stop him from doing his job until Flip gets there and says, what are you idiots doing? He's a cop. So, yeah, it's not just that racist cop that they bust that's kind of racist on that force. There are other elements that will assume, hey, he's a black guy. He's up to no good because he's running after a white woman. And so there is that um, hatred that even though they may not be members of the Klan, they're going to pre-assume based on um, uh, racial uh, it's not prototyping but racial profiling um, <laughs> well, so that, that, scene was, that scene was incredible but, uh, that was scene was but yeah well that's done. a super incredible intense scene and I feel that when you have an intense scene like that before you ramp it up even more you gotta have something that kind of settles the dust and so you get that reality no, of hey no. you gotta stop your investigation here but you know what Just for Ron to have, I mean, Ron could have been like, all right, I just had two cops stop me from doing my job when I'm a cop, too. They're taking my case away from me. Why am I still on the force? Mm -hmm. And so he, I think there's a reason like, hey, let's do one last prank call to David Duke and tell him, hey, this is who was actually setting you up the whole time. You're racist idiot. That's awesome. That's a really cool win for Ron. And I think this was just a nice little either lighthearted win to say like, hey, it's kind of like the Al Capone thing. Al Capone murdered a lot of dudes, but you bust them on tax evasion because that's all you can get them on. So since they're cops, they're the ones that can actually, if they have evidence, take them in. Then it's up for the court of law to decide I still how think, I think, bad I the penalty was, is going to be. Like so I think it works because right after they have that scene with the cops busted, you get the knock on the door of Ron's apartment. Patrice is there. He pulls out his gun. She pulls out her gun. They have that really cool like slide in up to the window and you see the cross burning. You see Ivanhoe leading the prayer and everything because now he's the new clan leader. And it's like yeah, you did this big, huge case and everything. You did stop um, a huge crime from committing, but the whole essence of hatred, whether it's a clan mask or whether it's people with tiki torches or whether it's people running over another innocent woman with a car, hatred will exist in human hearts, and it's not about eradicating it. It's about keeping it in check. But I think all the things I still that you think that scene still suck. Yeah, that supports our that supports our comments. That they could have shown they should they could have shown Ron Flip and uh, Laura Harrier's character at uh, the bar just celebrating the case and not have this big old like we got him guys type situation. Because you're you're absolutely right. The entire sequence preceding that and the entire sequence uh, anteceding. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know if that's a word, it, but sure. It, English. No, anteceding is a word. I don't know if I'm using it correctly. Um, <laughs> the entire sequence anteceding it uh, is incredibly powerful. We just got this one weird, weird, like, social justice circle jerk of, like, we got the racist guys. It just, it, it could have been without that, and it, you could have shown Flip. You could have shown the major characters at the bar just hanging out, having a job well done. And still had the exact same hit home when the chief said you can't you have to destroy all the documents. I think it also would have been I, I think if they would have combined the scenes and Brylan, I, I am completely in agreement with, with you besides the scene, right? I, I think everything right. yeah, you said too. was me correct, too. right? Yeah. Like for You sure. feel like it's just a minor speed bump well, in it, that. I think road. They, yes. I think what they could have done is take that like that scene and that sequence it would have been like we know right we know that racism is still terrible in today's society right yeah there's if if you arrest one person that doesn't it doesn't matter it doesn't give it it doesn't it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't eradicate yeah. racism you you put in that scene in to make people feel good but yep. you already have a scene in the movie for that so why not if you need to keep a bar scene if you want to keep a social scene right you take out the fact that you're trying to frame another cop and then you put in the fact that maybe from the bar, Ron asks to use a telephone, and then he calls David Duke, 
and it has like a split screen. Everybody in the bar is holding around the telephone, like like listening in as he's talking to Duke. And then he finally hits the line, like, "Are you sure?" And then everybody starts laughing about it. And <laughs> and that is the moment you happen. You hang up the phone. We have that celebration of you know, fuck that dude. He's still gonna be whoever he's he want. David Duke's after this continue to do whatever he wanted to fucking do then we see the scene of you know the cross burning and it and that is a literally the epitome of it doesn't it like arguably like they made some steps or made some giant leaps to do some something right to get these people out but racism and hatred will always wear like exactly like you said a, a, a different face and so it doesn't matter like well, it really, it, it really it offended me, and it really made me upset that they they chose to put that scene in to lighten the mood from when we just seen some, a bunch of people just get blown up in a car, and mm-hmm. we still see institutional racism just before of those guys not believing and arresting and putting them on the ground. Arguably, I swear, I for sure thought Ron was going to get shot and killed. Yeah, in me that too. Sequence. Yeah, and yeah. I think, in, in arguably, right? I don't want to. I never wanted like really this happen this, but like that shit would have happened in real life. He would have been dead. Like, let's be honest, man. Like, he has a gun. He's running after a white woman, and fucking people and children died like this year, last year about it. Mm. So I have really big issues with them showing the uh, redemption of the police force. I think that I think that's how I was like kind of titled. I was like, wait, hold up, what the fuck? Like that that scene does that scene there just doesn't match. Again, if, all the other stuff they would that done. It doesn't if, play to that. If, I mean, I don't think it plays that strongly as a like we want we beat racism scene. That's my oh, whole no, point. Oh no, I totally did. It, it, it totally did though. Did. There, it doesn't feel like that so to me. At no point, at no point in the movie were we to believe that uh, uh, the fi- uh, master patrolman Andy Landers was had anything to do with the relationship or um, ties to the KKK. And so we're looking at this character of this is a racist police officer because racism exists. The KKK exists because they're assholes, whatever you want to say, all the negative shit about them. So now this scene ties everything together in a a tidy, a nice knit bow. And it's like, oh, well, we have both of these errors that we've already brought up into this movie. And the best way that we're going to resolve it is, you know, we'll arrest them. And that's like – that, but that's not going to solve anything. Like, I just had a lot of issues with that scene a lot. That scene infuriated the shit out of me, and so yeah, maybe it doesn't affect me that much because it's not the end of the movie. Yeah, that's, I mean that's true. There's more that happens after it. Yeah, I mean, but at, yeah, at but it the caused, time, it's just, if I, the movie I, ended I there, it. I'd be like, this is bullshit. Yeah, but why have it in the movie? Like, <laughs> yeah, it, I'm looking it, at it, and Spike Lee and the in the like Spike Lee the writer. They put this movie in, even the cinematographer and everybody who cut this movie. They chose to put this in the movie for a reason. Everything and anything in the movie in a play that they put on screen is put in for the reason. Yeah, so sitting here, it watered sitting, it down. It totally yeah, watered it down. You choose to put this in the movie. You choose to splice this. In after a sequence of people are dying from a bomb and you see institutional racism, and then, uh, and then before, and then excuse me, before and then after this scene, we see all the other stuff him him calling David Duke and then the cross burning. That doesn't like the, the tone of the movie. That does not match at all, and th- that's why I have such a big issue with it. There's a lot of issues that I have with this movie, but that's why I had the biggest issue with that is because now you're saying, yeah, but. He's getting, you know, even for the side part, we haven't even talked about it. Okay, so what? He's arrested for what? Committing hate crimes? What's going to happen oh, to it's him? It's for assaulting a police officer. Yeah, sure. I mean, but what's going to happen to him? Probably nothing. He's going to go to jail. He'll get a day in court. That yeah, is. We don't but, know what the outcome yeah, but no, is. I mean, so it's. It it's just only to the point where why, why show a bunch it? of cops could take him behind the the bar and beat him with a. Like padlocks sure, and stuff. But like, Who knows? That doesn't change his like his mindset. Like that. It, no, it won't go. It's not going to change. You're not going to change him from being racist for how much of a racist he yeah, is. Yeah, for sure. But my, I guess the the other thing, and I know you know we, we'll move on in a second. We, we've been talking about this one scene for a while. Yeah. You know, I, and it's a very minor scene, not, which is well, hilarious. Here's the thing, Brylin, it's not, man. Like. It's these circum, it's these sequences and these things that are put in the movie that literally derails an entire movie. 
and it's curious as to me. I'm like, but that what i'm 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 very very confused and i guess the the fact that it ties back into flip's line earlier of like we protect our own right and we'll handle our own in-house and all that stuff about the camaraderie but we don't see them do anything we don't see them do anything the entire movie we don't see them do anything about this cop that they know is you know sexually harassing people they know is a racist cop and so in in this sequence alone uh, in the sequence now like Okay, Ron does it, and now they they try to tie it all up. But it's like that's not how it works. It's, it's such an unrealistic scene because we know for a fact that there's other people in that station that are just like this same officer. Yet one person's going to go to jail for being a racist. But what about all these other people that knew what he was doing and chose not to do nothing? There's no sort of consequence for them, and I, I just tend to have a big issue with that. Yeah, I felt like a cheap win. It was just totally just a cheap win, just like to appease people. I'm what? with you, Warren. I, I couldn't, I couldn't stand it at all. Uh, what else you got, Brown? Because yeah. <laughs> I know we, we've been right. talking about this scene a lot. So <laughs> yeah, talk- and uh, we'll probably just, talk just about this next scene a lot to too. Next, we're going to spend the next 20 minutes tearing it down. <laughs> no, that's not true. Yeah, I think it's uh, that's racial. I mean, unity. I'll still disagree. <laughs> I still disagree with y'all, but uh, I can see the point that y'all make. But I, if you want to look at it, like, why didn't they do anything sooner? Uh, they had bigger fish to fry. They were going after the clan. I mean, you got to pick who you're going to go after. That's the reality of it. Um, but the other, the last thing I want to talk about is they do cut in at the very end after the cross burning. It just jump cuts to depictions of Charlottesville. When everything happened there and we see the tiki torches being marched across the college campus. We see uh, the protesters. We see the guy drive his car into the crowd of protesters. And Spike Lee decides to end this as like a memoriam for the young lady that got killed in the protest. And he has an upside down American flag on it. So to me, this movie was already powerful seeing that cross burning happen. And if they stopped the movie there, I'd be like, wow, this is a powerful movie that people need to see. But he felt like a reason to tack on Charlottesville. And I don't think it takes away from how amazing this film is. I'm just curious, like, do you think it makes a difference whether or not they show Charlottesville or or if it's necessary to have Charlottesville at the end of this movie? So I... And I thought I had, like, this was probably the most problematic sequence um, that I had of it. I don't think it was necessary, but I think it was important, and I think they needed to show it. Um, But I think the movie talked about a a bunch of different things, and I felt like it definitely kind of shifted at one point in this movie and only talked about neo-Nazi, like, these Nazis that are here in the KKK, instead of talking about racism as a whole and like the biggest thing that I was is really like at this point I was just kind of saddened because the amount of people that have been lost for like police brutality and like it's not even as black people right the amount of people that were lost within the last year or so while this movie was being filmed and made and everything the fact that they show, chose to show the show and sort of memorialize the woman who died, only her in that sequence, it just felt very off-putting. And I, I, I mean, not only me, I had some really bad, like I had some pretty issues with it. But you know, I talked to my friend Shelby a lot about this. I talked to Emma a lot about this, and. There's a lot of people that were like, what the fuck was that? I don't think that should have been in the movie at all, right? I don't think I'm like that for yeah. about it, but I can definitely see how, again, this that's a scene in the movie that's going to be like, what the fuck? And people are going to be pissed off of what it's going to be showing. I, I don't know how to effectively do that, and I don't think you know, Spike Lee or any other people give a shit, right? It's a, I think it's a, it, the movie definitely turned to a piece of like performance art sort of uh, political piece, Um what she's going to do, what he wants to do, but it's, I think, I just think it was awkward. I think, I think it was kind of, I think it was just a little odd to end the movie like that. Um, so, Warren, 
Warren. We didn't yeah, to me, it, it felt like he was just trying to just hammer it home as hard as possible to the audience. Yeah, it's like, you know, all this stuff that happened in the 70s is still happening today. And you, you know what? It never changes. And I'm going to say things do change. Things do improve. But we still have hatred. Uh-huh. It's always going to be there. And as long as we either take a stand against it or make it irrelevant, we're doing our jobs. Mm. What's that, Blewett? Yeah, I think that a lot of the... So I agree with you. It's kind of weird to choose like some random white woman when most of your movie deals with white on black crime. Um, I think, though, that that's probably the most or the highest profile case involving someone who you could actively consider someone who's a neo-Nazi against someone in the general populace. And I think mm-hmm. that's the tie in. Yeah. I actually, I, I really liked it. Or the most, it's been the most public display of white supremacist violence right. we've had in the right. news. At least recently. Exactly. And I, so I, I don't follow the news well enough. You, there's probably again, viewers leave your comments. Um, uh, but the, that is the one that I can remember, you know? And so I think that it wasn't necessarily maybe how it could have or should have ended, but it's how it had to end. Mm-hmm. I think that, so I liked it. I liked the, the transition they did. I was it it was fire based, right? Like they, t- they took the flames from the cross and then merged yeah. it into like the tiki torches. Yeah. And what, what I was talking about, you know, however long ago, depending on how I edit this thing, um, the, the echoes that you take something from the past and merge it to what's going on now to make it easier to discuss is so incredibly powerful. So if you see like, there's not, at least in Boston, where we're all based in, there, like, I would doubt there's ever been a cross burning here. M- maybe. I mean, there's racist here, but, like, I doubt there's been a cross. <laughs> right? Like, I, maybe. I don't know. My family hasn't been here long enough. Um, Excuse me. I'm just going to sip on my Gatorade here. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, what? Your Gatorade white? <laughs> white. <laughs> Dude, kid almost ruined his microphone. So, I, I mean, so if there was, if there was, it's not like I'm not upset. Boston has obviously had a, uh, let's say, promiscuous past with uh, <laughs> with racism, racism. Eh, I can't talk right now. Um, but you know, it's it's one of those things that like it definitely is different than the South. And so to, to really drive that point home of like. Hey, this crap still happens, and we need to get there. Um, I, I I did like I well I didn't like the racist part, but like I did like the whole message that it was still happening in the modern day, and you could directly merge visuals from the past into the, the present. Um, I also yeah, my the, the reason why I'm kind of against it is like hey. Whoever's seeing this movie right now already lives in the modern day. They already know what's going on. So it's more, I feel it's more appealing to end it at the cross burning and say, like, oh, wow, I just watched something that's eerily similar to what I'm reading about in the news today. But you're not writing it for today. Like, do the right thing. You're writing it for history. Right. Do the right thing existed in what, 1989? And so, like, that is distinctly, you can watch that movie and understand how it was then. I feel that with this movie, you could understand how... It was 97. It was 97? It was later? Yeah. No, that was was in the 80s. It was 97. No way. No. All right. It's a 90s movie. It's a very 90s movie. I think you're getting another movie mixed up. No, fair enough. But uh, I I liked how it it echoed with this. Also, as... This is going to sound, I think, a little bit weird, but I've been I feel I feel fairly controversial the entire podcast. Um, white people make a pretty decent percentage of this, of this country right now, and it's it's majority population. <laughs> like, yeah, but that's not controversial. I'm like, well, no, it, it, no, it, it, no. Population densities or population demographics are not controversial. So, Clearly, this movie has a point, mm-hmm. a good point, mm-hmm. that white supremacy is bad, 
And I think that the easiest way to drive it home is to directly show that white supremacists and white supremacist groups do not care. Uh, it's kind of like Clayton Bigsby divorcing his wife for for having <laughs> affections because. affections for a black man, and so like you know, like you ruined the joke, by the way. No, well, yeah, I, I'm not saying that. <laughs> I, Brian's going to be the one. That's I said this in the pre pro. Brian's the hard R. Um, <laughs> no. But like the the thing about it, I think the easiest way to to win support to your side is to like make it as wide or mainstream as possible. And so to use a situation where a white lady was killed to appeal to people that might be like, all right, well, I'm in the center of things. I'm a centrist. I'm a moderate. Like I'm not, I vote Republican. I vote Democrat. Just kind of depends to use that situation to really expose the hypocrisy that is like the alt right or neo Nazis or white supremacist groups, I think will in the end garner more support to the central theme of the movie. I guess that's I mean, that's the controversial part that I think like I think will be part in that. I Sorry, guess. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, and you were right. Do the right thing is from 1989, by the way, but. Yeah, you were right. Oh, I was yeah. wrong. I'm sorry, blew it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the he got game I saw in the nineties, which is great. Did you just shut those Anyways, I think the thing that is a, a bit confusing to me was just the f- like it in the movie itself. It definitely depicted you know obviously a lot of KKK members and Black Panthers, but. You know, they definitely kind of. It definitely didn't feel like that ending of the movie matched what was happening in the movie because it just felt like we were talking about equal rights, civil rights, and things like that um, for black people to kind of rise up and for equality. And then you show a sequence at the end where I just don't think they needed to have a focus on the woman who died. I think they need to definitely kind of talk about it and talk about how much things have changed, right? It's obviously not black and white anymore. And I think that sequence at the end probably needed to show that. It's not black and white anymore. It's not black versus white, excuse me, anymore. It's now this weird-ass fucking group of people that's going to choose to hate for the sake of hating for now everybody else, white, black, like Spanish, Indian, like you name it, you're going to throw all the races and you throw all the mixes in there to show that it's basically the world versus these people. And I think that would have been a a, a progression of, again, hate will always have like a different face. Like now it's to the point where we're, we are among the the people of these people are fucking weird. Why are they hating people for, for what, like what sort of Nazism that they're trying to do this, this time. And so I just thought it was kind of strange of it just felt like it was a shift. And I guess my biggest issue was in the movie, they talked a lot about cops and police brutality and the shit that was happening to then it transitions to just neo-Nazis and KKK and the police brutality and cops, which has happened so much in the last year, two years, however you wanted to call it just they just didn't seem to give a shit about it and i i really felt some pretty big issues with that because it felt like that was the one thing that they chose not to talk about um or they just didn't want that that's not the story that they wanted to tell and so it 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 definitely kind of bothered me a lot of things bothered me for this movie again i know i said that before but it that like the ending sequence i was with it i'm like feel free like Please do something that's going to outrage people, that makes people upset, so that we can talk about it more. Yes, do that more and more. Please do. Yes, but let's show an actual depiction. Let's show what people are happening because we saw. I think they even saw. I don't think. I think they should have shown basically everywhere and anything that was happening all over the world, and show the fact that you know you have this group of people that's all different colors, races, sizes, and everything. Versus these Nazis. Like, I think that is what should have been shown, but it it just definitely felt like it was a memorial for the woman who died. And it felt like, well, what about all the other people who died? 
and that's what I, I felt pretty upset about. Yeah. So. Are uh, we ready to wrap this up? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, uh, all, all in all, you know, let's get into our um, lasting thoughts, because it looks like we talked about a lot. You know, we've been talking about a good amount of stuff. So before we uh, get into our lasting thoughts, what, lasting thoughts, what other couple things that we want to talk about before uh, we wrap it up? Uh, yeah, I just got to I want to give a shout out to the actor that played Ron Stallworth's uh, death sergeant. I just love whenever he could not help but crack up whenever Ron was on the phone with David Duke. Uh, he was great scenery during those times. Yeah, I thought that was great. I thought that was a lot of fun. They kind of they kept kind of injecting in the movies some silent comedy. I thought that was pre- kind of pretty cool. Uh, you know, a couple things that I uh, definitely kind of wanted to bring up. You know, one good, one bad. Uh, but it was it was curious as you know they mentioned CPT, and for everybody who does not know, it's colored people time. Uh, usually meaning that all black people are always late. And so they definitely kind of mentioned that almost as a joke in the movie. And I thought there was going to be a different type of payoff. But the sergeant uh, mentioned that to about Ron about being being on time, make sure you be on time. And every sequence after that, Ron shows up late. So I thought that was weird. Um, I did really enjoy that celebration, that dance sequence that they had um, in like the in the club, uh, sort of like uh, uh, disco, sort of seventies sort of vibe that they were having. I thought the visual representation right after the speech was just absolutely great. Uh, they have some great, great songs. They have some great music in this actual movie. So definitely go check that out because I've been listening to the soundtrack a, b- a bunch. And I think even Blue had said this. They played one of those songs from Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Um, yeah, Brandy. I, yeah, Brandy. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I love this song. So yeah. uh, I think that was great. And so definitely go check out the movie. And it's definitely worth the conversation. So please let us know what you think. Yeah, I'll add on to that, like, enjoyment of just, like, the visual style. I think they got the 70s look pretty accurate. It looked, but also looked very, like, uh, very sleek 70s, which I thought was really cool. And I thought they had a lot of great uh, wigs in this movie or costuming as well because um, it was hard to actually, besides Adam Driver, it was hard to actually recognize who the actors were in their roles. And I think that's a great sign of a great costume department. They had some uh, great wigs, too. There's some great afros. And uh, even David Duke had a great pedo helmet on as well. <laughs> that, did, that did sucks. <laughs> And with that, we are the Down to Front Podcast. Thanks so much for hanging out for a review of The Black Klansman, directed by Spike Lee, um, starring you know Alec Baldwin, mainly David John David Washington, um, and Adam Driver. Brylan, where can people find more of your work? Uh, you can find me. I am the host of the Gamescast. We have been back. We have been playing through the new World of Warcraft expansion, The Battle for Azeroth. So you can find us on twitch.tv slash down and from podcast. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter where I'm being non-racist and full of love at Brylon, B-R-I-L-U-N-D. And you can also find me on Instagram where every once in a while when I feel like it, I'll put a mini movie review up. So that's at, that's I am Brylon on Instagram. The fact that you said you you're being non racist may, makes me want to wonder. <laughs> is that it's only on Tumblr where I get racist? <laughs> ah, okay. Oh, that definitely definitely makes sense. Uh, if you if you haven't checked out the Gamecast, feel free. I actually use the Gamecast a lot for just like studying or just background, just kind of just hanging out. And I think one of the last times I was just listening to the audio through playing a monster hunter myself. So I thought it was absolutely great. I really hope they got some of the servers back up and running. Cause I know that's been a, a big thing for a lot of people, but it's definitely a very cool show. So we'll definitely go check that out. Yeah, that'll happen with the launch week, but it should be smooth by now. Uh, I I think this is one of the best movies of the year, and I think it was a perfect blend of Blazing Saddles and The Conversation, so definitely go see this movie. Uh, Blew It the Shredder, where can we find more of your work? You got any shows coming up? Uh, No. Uh, Also, I recommend this movie. I don't think I did a conclusion on it, but I recommend it. Uh, So the thing about the shredding is that it is definitely racist, uh, and it just pure opposition to Brylan's point. You know, he tried to claim that he wasn't racist, uh, and we're just going to be go out and say we're racist. 
Um, <laughs> also, speaking of racist things, uh, this one's a real one. Uh, go grab Jesse's pouches. Uh, Jesse Rand, friend of the show, co-host, uh, supporter, and overall emotional support. Like, he has created, he's taken up sewing as a new pastime. And he's created these wonderful multi-purpose pouches. Uh, so go grab one of Jesse's pouches. Yeah, I don't have a website. I, I assume the website will be grabjessiespouches.com. Oh, okay. But seriously, if you see him in the street, go grab Jesse's pouch. Um... I'm also, so confused you can, what this is talking about. I'll show it to you. I'll show you my pouch later. Okay. <laughs> uh, and we are the Down in Front podcast. I would also say uh, I recommend this movie. There's it's a bit problematic, and I think it derails a couple things. But I think I definitely would suggest it as a conversation starter to definitely kind of talk about how this movie made you feel. And so I definitely would recommend the movie for that. We're the Down in Front Podcast. You can find us anywhere and everywhere online. So definitely start off by checking out our website, downinfrontpodcast.com. Uh, we're going to be posting our video teasers. We have just about all of our information on there of how to actually follow us. So please definitely go check that out. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. So definitely find us on Twitter, underscore D-A-F-P. That's underscore for Down in Front Podcast. And we're on Facebook at facebook.com slash Podcast. And if you like what we do, and just for one dollar, Bob, if you like to see us kind of sip on wine and kind of hang out, definitely become a patron. Uh, just for one dollar, Bob, you know you can definitely kind of join in our Discord channel where we just talk lots of different movies, lots of different things. We'll add you to our general channel, which is quite hilarious. Thank you to the Abs Man. Um, so definitely go, you know, check that out. Definitely support us. patreoncom slash podcast. And I would say uh, we have a pretty, pretty cool SoundCloud account where Blewett puts a bunch of uh, original pieces of work. And so we've uh, he's been posting a bunch of our uh, – he makes all of our music. And so he posts all of our music for the introduction song and the, in- the, uh, the ending song. And, like, there's also the filler in between. So definitely go check out our work. Uh, find us online for that. Uh, find us on YouTube and definitely subscribe and like. And that will be cool. Uh, Thank you so much, everybody, for your time. And we will see you next time for a full review of Crazy Rich Asians. And I'm very hilariously excited about that movie.